about a year and a half ago already, it just flew by in December, Jan and I went down to the Los Alamos Nature Center, the Pajarito Nature Center, and we were able to see uh, Larry's talk at the planetarium. And although we don't have the cush sheets, um, you know, we had, you will be amazed at what he's about to show you. So I think you'll all uh, very much appreciate this. Um, Larry is a retired geneticist, so he comes to us with a, a skill level that you know many of us um, don't have. So he has researched this, and he had, once he retired, he focused on his backyard, and I think he's been um, active in doing a number of different um, studies on different plants. Clematis, I think, was mentioned, but um, Penstemon is um, his love, apparently his passion. And I think I read another thing that kind of called him the Penstemon Whisperer. So um, <laughs> I think if you have questions regarding, if you brought a sample or something, you can probably identify it. I think, are you going to let us buy the seeds? Uh, yes, if you so want to. So I asked him to bring some seeds if he had some from the garden. Um, we did a follow-up tour, um, a field trip uh, last year, um, where we actually saw the gardens. And I think maybe we might have missed our opportunity. It's still going. if we got together and did it quickly, apparently we'll still catch a number of them. Um, but we might also, um, so if you want to do that, let us know immediately because we'll have to organize that immediately. But um, we can also plan for next year and try to hit it, you know, I think he said mid-May would be often. Late May. Late May, yeah, late May. Late May. So, so we can also try for that because you absolutely, he's probably going to show you pictures from it. You absolutely have to go up there and see his jewel. So, Larry. <coughs> I, I want to first of all thank Catherine and Jan for inviting me. I think you're going to gather in the course of my comments that I've become very fond of these plants the last three or four years. And uh, when, one of the things that I really enjoy is having a chance to tell people about them. And, and so I appreciate the opportunity. I wanted to say, I, I'm going to leave these up here so you can look at them later. I wanted to say at the very beginning, uh, in terms of reference materials, there's a book called Penstemons by Robert Knoll. I think there are still, I think it's still available in a paperback edition, but you can get used copies of it in Amazon. My very favorite book of, about Penstemons is this Robert Knoll book uh, called Penstemons. Uh, growing Penstemons, species, cultivars, cultivars, and hybrids. This is a book uh, put together by the American Penstemon Society, and I like this too. Uh, slightly uh, less than, than this book. This was my first uh, sort of Bible for the Penstemons. But this is also a very good book. And there's another one. Uh, first of all, yeah, there is this uh, Heflin book, The Penstemons of New Mexico, which you have on sale up here. And there's another book called Northwest Penstemons. Uh, that sounds pretty regional, but you'd be surprised at the amount of overlap between Penstemons that grow here and Penstemons that grow there. And this is also a very scholarly book by a person named Dee Strickler. Um, it, it's no longer available except in used bookstores or where you can find it. But if you have, if one of you is a member of the American Penstemon Society, when, when this gentleman died, uh, he gave the remaining books, and I, I understand there, there are quite a few of them, to a member of the uh, society to, to sell for the society. And, and they're on sale for $10, so that's another uh, good, good uh, reference book. I, I'd also like to ask you just a few questions uh, before I start telling you what I know about penstemons. How many of you are growing penstemons now or have grown them in the past? Wow. Uh, how many of you have grown more than five species? Well, again, uh, very good. Um, uh, maybe you'll be telling me uh, things about the uh, I, I have one other question I want to ask, and that is, <clears throat> how many of you have either read or been told that the word penstemon means five stamens? How many people? Okay, so a few. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to start by trying to define what penstemons are, and the reason I asked this question about 
uh, five stamens, uh, about half of the general wildflower books, maybe 60%, uh, say that the word penstemon comes from penta five and stamen uh, thread or, or uh, stamen thread, uh, meaning five uh, stamens. And that bothered me when I first started reading about penstemons because they actually don't have five stamens. Uh, you can see they have four. Uh, I have a They have four. Uh, two of them are in the upper side. Let's see, first of all, let's talk about the corolla, uh, the part that we would call the flower. It has uh, an upper lip, which is removed, and, and that has two lobes in it. And then there's a lower lip, which is still here, with uh, three lobes in it. And, and then inside the flower are four stamens. Uh, two of them are at the top of the corolla tube, and two of them are at the bottom. One of the beautiful examples of Mother Nature's engineering uh, designed so that when insects walk in this tube, uh, uh, they, they will either pick up pollen hair, on, on the hairs in their body from these two lower uh, stamens or from the two upper ones or from both of them. But it, it maximizes the, the chances that an insect will pick up pollen and carry it with it. And here is the, the pistil of the flower, going back to the ovary. And then there's this other structure with the, the funny golden hairs on it. And, and that is called a staminode. Um, it's actually the, the idea of five stamens, and, and there are only four stamens. This is a modified stamen, but nevertheless, uh, there, there are actually only four actual stamens. There are also other plants that have four stamens and a staminode, uh, and there are plants that have five stamens. So I was often puzzled as to why people said penstemon five stamens. I'm going to try to uh, define for you how, how that concept came to be. At any rate, uh, this uh, staminode uh, in penstemons is you, you notice that it's, it's as long or longer than the anthers, and that's important. Um, there's another genus of flowers called chelone, or the turtle heads, that are closely related to penstemons. And chelones have four uh, stamens and one staminode, but the staminode is a short uh, structure, like maybe this long, and it never has hairs on it, it never has a knob on the end, it's in, in, the term, in the words that botanists use, it's undeveloped. So that's been a major <coughs> distinction between the genus of Chelone and the genus of Penstemon. Um, uh, the, the, the person who first described uh, Penstemon <coughs> was probably looking at a species <coughs> called Levogatus, <coughs> which happens to be Brosilis, but he saw a very similar thing. I, 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 I did not, until now, have Leva Goddess in the Penstemon Garden in Los Alamos, but I do now, and, and I plan to have a flower like this as soon as I get a flower. There are new plants this year. But at any rate, uh, John Mitchell, who described the first Penstemon in 1748, uh, about 30 years before our, our Revolutionary War, uh, saw something very similar to this uh, when he looked. And today people speculate, he didn't actually write this, but they believe that he had seen Chelone because they're also, he lived in Virginia, and Chelones are also in Virginia. And since they had this short staminode, and here was a much longer, more developed staminode, they think that he put together a Latin word, pena, P-A-E-N-E, uh, which means almost. When that becomes anglicized, it becomes pen, as in peninsula, almost an island. And, and so what they think he was saying was almost a stamen, that here we have gelonies with a, a very short, undeveloped stamen, and here's a much longer one. And so he, he put together these words in a very clever way to define uh, the genus penstemon as uh, almost a stamen. So where did the five stamen things come from? And, and uh, we'll now take a look at, uh, yeah, at, at what happened. Uh, uh, what I described so far happened in 1748. Just six years after that, 
Linnaeus published the Species Plantarum, where for the first time, all of the known plants of the world were put into binomial nomenclature, like penstem and, uh, uh, penstem and uh, barbatus, or, or uh, any other uh, binomial name for, for a plant. When uh, uh, John Mitchell had published a treatise, and this gives you an idea of the activity that was going on in the plant world at that time, he published a treatise, some call it a dissertation, in which he listed 30 new genera of plants. Think of it, 30 new genera, not 30 species, but 30 genera that, that he had described in, in the area around uh, Virginia. And, and he published this work, Linnaeus gathered together all the published material uh, up to 1753, and uh, he did two things. He changed Penstemon, uh, uh, John Mitchell did not define a species name. He simply defined the genus, the name of the genus Penstemon. And so uh, Linnaeus changed uh, the, the genus name to Chelone. He felt that, that what Mitchell had found was another turtle head. And he called the species Penstemon. He changed the spelling to P-E-N-T-S-T-E-M-O-N. And, and uh, people think that he, one, thought that Mitchell couldn't spell, and two, uh, he thought that uh, the word was supposed to have come from Penta 5 and Stamon uh, thread. Well, it turns out that Mitchell was a highly educated man. He was a physician, which meant he could speak and write in Latin and Greek. Uh, he actually was a cartographer, and he's given credit for drawing the map that George Washington used during the Revolutionary War, as well as Generals Howe and Cornwallis. So he was a very accomplished person, and I'm sure he knew the difference between Penna and Penta. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Linnaeus, who was the uh, major influence in the plant world at the time, published this book, and uh, uh, Mitchell kind of very quietly uh, in 1769 republished uh, his treatise or his dissertation and he spelled Penstemon, P-E-N-S-T-E-M-O-N as we spell it today. Uh, someone in the 1920s, a botanist who was interested in Penstemons, uh, found uh, this, this uh, work that Mitchell had done and, and because original names and original spellings in the plant world have priority. Uh, uh, he he uh, wrote a paper suggesting that the, the name should not be spelled P-E-N-T-S-T-E-M-O-N, but, but spelled Pensman. That was in the 20s, and it wasn't until the 40s or 50s that that actually happened. It took 200 years. Once Linnaeus uh, misspelled the word, it took 200 years to straighten it out. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you all of this, uh, one, I think it's an interesting story, but two, uh, because where we are now, uh, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that, that chelonies and penstemons can be differentiated by the length of the staminode and also by the seeds. Uh, one of them, chelonies have wind seeds, Penstemons do not. That held for a very long time, but once people got to the western part of the United States, some of the penstemons there overlapped, and there were arguments about whether or not uh, they, there, there were clear differences. And, and the reason that's important today, the molecular people are looking at that, this now, the, the DNA molecular people, and if they can't find differences between some of the chelonies and some of the penstemons, all of these plants that we know as penstemon today are going to become chelonies because of this uh, prior uh, use. Uh, uh, okay, next. Uh, okay, this is uh, this is Linnaeus's entry, and uh, the way he arranged the planta is, is to uh, list a, a genus. Is that a picture? Yeah. Uh, list a genus, uh, this is the third chelone uh, that he's listed, the other two are on a previous page, and here is Penstemon, P-E-N-T-S-T-E-M-O-N, 
And another clue that he felt Mitchell couldn't spell is down here where he references Mitchell's work. Even there, he spells it P-E-N-T-S-T-E-M-O-N. And, and so uh, probably this idea that, that he felt that Mitch, Mitch, Mitchell meant something that he didn't and misspelled it uh, got started. Uh, at any rate, here is an intact uh, penstemon flower. This is a, a palmeri, and you can see uh, uh, two of the stamens in the upper part of the flower. The other two would be down here. You can see this uh, very well-developed uh, stamenode, and uh, you can tell how the, the plants got their, their sort of nickname, uh, beard tongue. Uh, some people believe that, that these hairs are to increase the likelihood that an insect entering the flower will brush against the, the pollen tubes. I don't know about that because some of the, some of the stamenodes do not have uh, hair. Some of them have a knob on the end. Some of them have short hair. Some of them have uh, very few hairs. But at any rate, um, uh, some people feel that, that that might be a purpose for it. I, I like to say just a few words about why have a garden devoted to one genus of plants. And one of the reasons is that there are many of them. Uh, there are actually not 300 species yet. They're somewhere around the mid 280s to the high 280s. Uh, the reason I say 300, again, the molecular people are looking at it, and so far, they, they haven't, you know, they're either uh, people who lump together uh, groups of plants or those who split them apart. And most of the molecular work has uh, indicated that some species should be split into two. So I'm expecting that uh, in, in the next 20, 25 years, we're going to have around 300 species. They have, as most of you know, because you've grown them, they have intense uh, colors, uh, shades of red, blue, and purple, and there are a few uh, yellow penstemons. They're drought tolerant, which is very important for us, but it's important for people throughout the country these days. They're American native plants. Uh, these are all New World plants. They exist from Alaska to Guatemala and, and from the East Coast to the West Coast in the United States. Uh, they're abundant in the numbers and varieties in the Southwest. Um, uh, Utah has the highest number of species of any state. It's around 78. Uh, uh, New Mexico has around 42 or 43. Uh, uh, Penstemons are believed to have originated in the Southwest and then evolved and spread out um, to the eastern part of the United States, to the Pacific Northwest, and so on. And so uh, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have many species left in the, in the uh, arid Southwest, fewer in, in the other realms, but uh, every state uh, except Alaska has at least one native penstemon. And finally, they don't require enriched soils or, or fertilizer. Uh, you can simply plant them. In fact, it's much better to plant them in our native soils than it is to plant them in soils that are enriched with humus. Uh, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on seed propagation. Uh, one, because I've spent a lot, many, many hours on, on this subject. And two, because I think there would be a lot more penstemons in nurseries or in your gardens because you grew them from seed if they were uh, more accessible to grow from seed. And the reason I say accessible, uh, uh, these seeds as well as a number of other seeds in our arid uh, southwest or from our, our high altitude plants uh, have germination inhibitors. So that if you plant, for example, a penstemon seed in a pot and sit it on a windowsill like you would with a bean or a corn, it can sit there for 15 years and it won't germinate. Uh, these germination inhibitors are chemicals that somehow block the chemical processes that have to take place in order for germination to occur. And people have found in, in the past 25 years uh, several ways of, of trying to destroy these inhibitors. Two major ones I just want to mention. One developed by Norman Dino. Norman felt that 
the, the reason Mother Nature uh, can germinate these seeds and we can't is because Mother Nature goes through uh, cyclical uh, changes in temperature. And he reasoned that three months of the year, winter, are at around uh, average at 40 degrees, three months of the year average about 70 degrees, and then in, be in between each of those there are about three months of, uh, of temperate uh, of temperatures. And, and so he felt that the way to get these seeds to germinate was to put them through a three-month cycle in the cold and then in the warm and then in the cold and so on until they germinated. And here is just one example. This is for Penstem and Grandiflorus. Uh, and this is Norman's uh, shorthand. Here, if he treated these seeds at 70 degrees first, 20% of them germinated in three months. Then he moved it to 40, 5% germinated in those three months, back to 70, 25% germinated. He also found that if he started at 40, he got no germinations. Then he went to 70, and 3% germinated. Then to 40, 3%, then to 73%. Um, this, this process sometimes works. It sometimes doesn't. Uh, it takes a long time, and sometimes you, you can spend a year and, and realize that you're never going to get any germination. So, I, I, on the other hand, Norman made some enormous contributions. His work is in a series of volumes. It's, it's now, I think, available on the internet, and the journal Native Plants has recently republished all of his uh, results, and it's available there. The Penstone and Society Manual, the, the, the second book that, that I recommended, uh, sees germination as a two-step process. One that involves the induction of germination, uh, but not germination itself, and that occurs at uh, 40 degrees, and then germination itself doesn't occur until you elevate the temperature to 70. And so in their book, for each of the species, they'll, they'll recommend that you cold, moist treat them, they call that cold, moist stratification, for from 2 to 16 weeks, and this is species specific. For species A, uh, 2 weeks, for species B, 8 weeks, for species C, 16 weeks, and so on. And, and again, um, I, I, if I have any criticism of this, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. They, they say for nearly each species of penstemon that if it doesn't work, hold them for a second year, and maybe then they'll germinate. So again, you can, uh, you know, like Norman's work here, you, you could spend a year getting, if you had 10 seeds, you would spend a year getting one seed to germinate. Uh, <laughs> down here, you might spend uh, one cycle and get no germinations, and then the next cycle, you may or may not get germinations. And also, these are planet seeds, so you have to worry about keeping them moist versus drying out, all that sort of thing. I, I tried both of these, and, and they're, they're, um, they're not always very rewarding, is the best thing I can say. <laughs> the, penstemon, the, the plants in the Penstemon Gardens, um, I was able to germinate all of these by what I can talk, could, what I call, let's see, we can't see it, uh, this lower thing. That, yeah, to <laughs> continuous stratification. Uh, and, and that simply is, put the seeds at 40 degrees in damp, I, I use paper towels, I use Petri dishes, I'll show you in a minute, but you could use uh, plastic bags, they would work equally well, and you just keep them there until they germinate, and they will germinate. Uh, I, I've done this for about 150 different species now, and, and there are a few exceptions. There are a few species that do germinate at 70 degrees. Only a few, though. And, and some, of the, uh, some of the hybrids will, will uh, germinate at 70 degrees. But nearly all of the species uh, will germinate at, at 40 or 42 degrees. Uh, at various lengths of time. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. These are materials that I found to be useful to do this, petri dishes. Uh, these are discs of paper towel, toothpicks, and these are Jiffy 7 pellets. You actually don't need these. Uh, I, I used these uh, for the first three years. I used them every time. Now I found that you can take these germinated seeds and transfer them directly into 
two by two inch pots, and we'll see that in a minute. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, here's what they look like. Uh, these are penstemon seeds sandwiched between two uh, discs of paper towel. Some of the seeds stick to the upper disc, and, and so when you fold this back, about half of them are in the top and half of them in the bottom. Here, I don't know if you can see in the back, but some of these have little, uh, have germinated and they have little sprouts. Here you can see these little white lines on Jiffy 7 pellets. Uh, and, and now what needs to be done, you take a toothpick and make a little hole in the Jiffy 7 pellet and plant it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I, I like to get the seeds immediately after they germinate because this rootlet, uh, it's called a radical, is brittle and, and they're, they're fairly easy to break. Ne next slide, please. If they get too long, you can see here uh, root hairs have formed. This is actually a, a, a seedling embryo. Uh, the, the cotyledons are beginning to, to get a little bit of green color. The other interesting thing about this method of holding them at 40 or 42 degrees is that when these little tiny embryonic plants develop, they can sit for two or three weeks, and they sit just like this, and you can lift them out if you don't break them, and plant them, and they'll grow. So you don't have to be, be uh, looking at the discs or the paper towel or the, the uh, plastic bags all of the time. The, these little sprouted seeds uh, will, will last at, at, at the pool temperatures, okay? Uh, I, I keep track of what's going on by, uh, this is the name of the, the uh, dish uh, that is here. The, uh, the plant that it is in it is called Brandigii. Uh, these seeds were started in the refrigerator at, uh, January, on January 27th. Uh, February 20th, three of them germinated. On the 24th, one germinated all the way out here to March 28th, when one germinated. Ne next slide. So if you take this kind of data, I, I, I now have data, as I said before, on, on nearly 150 species. It looks something like this. So this is a ge the genus, uh, or the species, Thurberi. And the first number here is the number of days in the refrigerator, uh, six days for this. And at that point in time, 7% germinated. It went all the way out to 33 days, and by that time, 55% had germinated. Grandiflorus uh, went 22 days in the refrigerator, when 14% germinated, all the way out to 131 days, and by that time, 86% had germinated. And, and these numbers go up in time, you see. For Rostrophorus, 49 days until the first germination, then there were a lot, 30%, and it went out to 121 days, and by that time, 78% of those seeds had germinated. And here, uh, procumbens went all the way to 131 days when 19% germinated, and went out to day 247 when, fifth, by that time, 50% had germinated. So next slide, please. It, here's one other thing I wanted to just mention. This is uh, one disc that was cut in half. This was a disc actually for procumbens. And when it got to 100 days, I thought, oh, here's a species that can't germinate at 42 degrees. It has to be elevated in temperature. So I cut the, the uh, paper towel disc in half and incubated this half at 70 degrees, and this half I kept at 42 degrees. You, you can see uh, uh, two germinations here and here and one here. No germinations over here. This one never germinated, and the data that I showed you before came from this half of the disk. So in this particular case, this is very limited data, but in this particular case, moving the, the seeds from cold to warm too early did something that prevented germination for six months. You know, there was never any germination in those seeds. Next, uh, next slide, please. So when you do all of this, this is what you have left. This is, these are five plantlets of, uh, of Penstemon neomexicanus. These were from this spring. Uh, I was still planting in Jiffy 7 pellets. You notice that they're along the edge of the Jiffy 7. There's a reason for that. I, I think when these plants are little, and when they're either in pots or in a Jiffy 7 disc like this, 
the, the roots need moisture, of course, but they also need air. And so I'd like to plant them either close to the side of the pot or close to the edge of, of this thing. And I think they, they do better that way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I said before, now I go directly into two-inch pots. And these are pots where I planted seeds around the edge. You, you can see most of these uh, followed through and grew up into little plants. Uh, in some cases, there, there are fewer than others. But this is like, this is like six or eight different species of penstemons here. Uh, seeds that were germinated at uh, 42 degrees and then planted in these two-inch pots. You do have to use sterilized soil. So if you can get potting soil that's been milled, especially for, uh, uh, for uh, young seedlings. And, and that's what I use uh, for these uh, two-inch pots. Next slide, please. Here's just a, a, a picture of a collection of Jiffy 7 pellets. Next slide. And, and here are the plants when they're divided up and put singly into two-inch pots. And the next slide. Uh, and then the plants are moved out, out into my patio uh, where they first exist, as you see them here, in like half sun, half shade, and, and then eventually to full sun. It depends on the time of year. Earlier than now, uh, you can plant these out after just a few days of this kind of treatment. Now I like to give them almost a week of full sun before I put them in the, the uh, garden itself because of the intensity of the sun uh, without any shade and, and the exposure in the gardens. Next slide, please. Uh, just a few words about cultivation as opposed to uh, germination. Do not enrich the soil. I've already mentioned that. Uh, they grow perfectly well in our native soils. Do water the young transplanted seedlings uh, until they show signs of growth. And then you can gradually reduce water. Uh, I like to water the mature plants in the garden if we don't have any rainfall for a month or, or more. Uh, for example, I watered one time this spring so far, the, the gardens at the Nature Center. Uh, I found this by accident. The county uh, who built the Nature Center and put the beds in that I later planted penstemons in, covered them all with something called pressure finds. It's crushed rock, uh, and, and the ones that we use are called Santa Fe Brown. It's crushed uh, sandstone. You can also get crushed granite. You can get these in several different colors. But I, I think that the, the pressure finds hold moisture, and also I think that the water leaching through them uh, enriches the soil underneath with minerals, and that's exactly what you read again and again in books that penstemons like, mineral soils. So uh, it's, I, I think this was just a, an ideal situation. I, I don't know how many people are using that, but I highly recommend it. And finally, uh, do not let mature plants carry a full load of seed pods. Uh, they tend to set a whole lot of seed, and if you let them carry all of them to completion, they exhaust themselves so that either the, the bloom the following spring is reduced, or the plant actually dies uh, through the winter after uh, bearing a, a, a full load of seeds. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to the Nature Center at Los Alamos, this is the footprint of it. Uh, this is the Nature Center itself. This is an island in the parking lot uh, that, with penstemons in it. This is a separate bed east of, of that island. There's a bed here behind the building and a separate bed here uh, outside of the back door of the building. There are now penstemons uh, in beds here and in beds under this eave of the building, and there are penstemons over here and in a circle here. I, I, this is not up to date yet, but anyway, that's the basic layout. The first picture I'm going to show is taken from around here. It, it's up a slight hill looking down uh, at the overall gardens. Is that from this year? Uh, this is from last year, okay. from uh, probably uh, last, uh, uh, let's see, this is last June. And you can see three early morning visitors to the garden here. Uh, this is the, the island in the center. The, the bed to the east is back here. This is the bed beside the, the, the rear door. There, there's a, a large bed 
in the other side of this shed, and then there are pen stones along here and here and around this side of the building. Uh, the next picture is going to be the front of this bed here, and, and that looks about like this. So the next picture is the middle of that uh, bed, and, and with the, uh, the, the center in the background. I'm going to come back and talk about individual species, mostly New Mexico species, but I'm going to come back and talk about individual species in, in just a minute. Uh, go ahead, next picture. Uh, this is the uh, end of that island bed. And the next picture. And this is the, the bed that's east of the island bed. Next picture. This is the bed behind the building. Uh, this picture, the rest of the pictures are from last year. This picture was taken just two or three days ago. Um, next picture. This is the, the bed just behind the, the back door of the building. Next picture. Uh, I, I wanted to mention that these plants are beautiful when they're blooming, but they're also very attractive at other times of the year. This is the spring, of course. Some of them are gray, some are blue-green, some are green, and with the growing tips being maroon. Uh, next picture, so there are a lot of colors when, when growth starts. This is in the fall, uh, the seed pods on this particular species called tupiflorus are purple colored, and they shine in the morning and, and uh, afternoon sun. Uh, another uh, very attractive thing. Next picture, please. This is uh, the first species. This is uh, Angustifolius. This particular species was very popular in, in uh, Victorian Britain. Uh, people had not seen this kind of blue uh, flowers in the plant world, and they all wanted to have one, and, and uh, they were very popular. This, this is uh, Angustifolius, Angustifolius. Uh, it exists primarily in the Great Plains, but it, it eases into the edge of northern, north, uh, eastern New Mexico. Next picture. The more common Angustifolius that we have here is this one called Caldatus. Uh, and this is also a very nice plant. It blooms over a very long period of time. Uh, you can see the flowers are in these little uh, thirsts, I think they call them, but they're, they're isolated little segments of of buds and, and flowers, the, the plant begins to bloom when it's only around 10 inches high and it continues uh, up, up until the, the, the top blooms are exhausted. So the bloom for these plants lasts uh, one and a half, some years, two months. Uh, very nice plant. It's a subspecies. Pardon? It's a subspecies of uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is Angustifolius angustifolia. Oh, so okay. it's the, the first uh, subspecies. This is uh, Albinus, and, and if you look carefully at these pictures, uh, th this plant exists in northern New Mexico, going north up into Canada. Uh, there are uh, two distinct colors here. One is a pure white, and one is, um, uh, has some lavender to it. Uh, I bought the seeds from a company called All Plains, and, and they were advertised as being lavender and being white, and sure enough, the seeds that were supposed to be lavender were lavender, and the seeds that were supposed to be white were white. I mention that now because later we're going to see uh, that doesn't hold for all instruments, but in that particular species, the colors hold. This is cespitosis, which is very attractive, as they all are when it's blooming. Next slide, please. It's also attractive when it's not blooming. Uh, this particular plant has now grown up over this rock, and half the, the corner here of the rock is covered. Uh, very beautiful rock garden plant. Ne next uh, picture. This is Etonii, uh, one of my favorites of the New Mexico uh, penstemons. Uh, it exists naturally in the Four Corners area and, and somewhat east of there, but but it predominantly, it's, it's a plant uh, of southern Utah and, and Nevada. Um, uh, it has beautiful foliage. You can see the, the crinkled edges to the leaves and, and the uh, deep green to blue-green color. Next, next slide, please. Uh, it, it holds leaves on the ground. The stems uh, uh, die and, and dry up over winter. But the, uh, the basal leaves remain, and, and they remain attractive. They, they have some of these maroon shades in them. Uh, they, they, they stay uh, shine through the winter. Next, 
this is linear oides, uh, a plant of, of uh, western uh, New Mexico, both north and south. Next uh, slide, this is a pinion juniper country. Uh, this is a white version of linear oides. Uh, this is a plant called uh, Brachyphyllus. Um, uh, this is not listed in the, uh, the book that's for sale up here of New Mexico penstemons, but D. Wood Ivy lists it as uh, uh, a New Mexico penstemon in his book, and it doesn't surprise me because it's very common in, in Utah in the Four Corners area, and, and uh, I'm sure that some of it has spread over into uh, New Mexico. It's also found in Colorado. Say this that is, name again. Pardon? Say that name again. This one. Uh, uh, Brachyphyllus. Brachyphyllus. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's normally a blue color. Next slide, please. Yeah. This is this is also wow. Brachyphyllus, oh, wow. and the the purple color uh, is is more unusual. But uh, this it, 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 it's a very good plant, a very strong plant. Uh, very drought resistant and it blooms early and, and it has this almost sky blue uh, color to, to most of, of the plants. Next slide, please. This is Superbus, a uh, plant from south uh, western New Mexico. Um, uh, this is a very nice plant, brilliant, but they look, these plants look like this the first year. The second year, uh, they might be this high uh, with, with maybe two or three stems of flowers and by the third year they're gone. Um, I, uh, it's disappointing, and I don't know if there might be strains that will last longer or not, but I've never had much success with keeping this plant longer than, than three years. I'll but, let you know, because I'm on the first year of these. Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> well, I have one that's blooming like this for the third year, and, and so I'm hopeful that we'll see what happens this winter. Next up. This is Alamosensis. Uh, it's, uh, it's a similar flower to Superbus, smaller, uh, and the flowers are more orangey. Uh, it, it has uh, interesting uh, blue-green foliage, and, and uh, I think it might be a more permanent plant than, than Superbus. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, the, the blue form of Virgatus, which occurs close to the Colorado border and is very common in Colorado. The, the more common version here is white colored. And next slide, please. And it looks something like this. Uh, uh, this is a, a wild plant, and this is a plant in the gardens. Uh, many of you know Chick Keller. Chick often walks out and he'll say, boy, I never saw a Virgatus that looked like that. And, and I didn't really know why, and I, I think now that I do, you know, I start these plants in like January, and many of them are ready to go out as soon as the weather uh, becomes warm. And so the first year, they, they spend that whole year dividing into many growth uh, points <coughs> down here at the ground. And the second year, each of those growth points forms a stem. Whereas these wild plants, uh, they, they germinate, I think, in the very early spring. They only begin to come up, though, around the time, I mean, be obvious, around the time the rains start in July. So they only have a month or two to grow, and, and then they have to go dormant, and the next year they only have one growth point, and that forms this one stem. And if it's allowed to go to seed, uh, the plant probably won't subdivide very much, if at all, and, and so I think that's the major difference. In fact, if you look in the garden now, there, there are areas where you find uh, four or five plants like this and 30 plants in the area around it that look like this. So uh, I think they're exactly the same. Uh, the, the plants in the garden don't get fertilizer. They do get occasional water that wild plants don't get. Next slide, please. This is uh, another plant from Los Alamos County called Oleganthus. This one barely exists on slender stems with a few wispy flowers. Uh, Chip Keller found this in, in his searches of Los Alamos County. Here in the garden, it's, uh, it's a beautiful plant. Uh, has lots of the small white with uh, blue-tinged uh, flowers on it. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another New Mexico uh, plant from the Four Corners area called Comarenus. 
Um, I, I have some better pictures this year, but I didn't have a chance to get them into to my, my lecture tonight. It's a difficult plant to photograph because it's this very pale blue uh, color. It, it tends to grow from uh, basal, uh, basal leaves to uh, stems that go up to, oh, as, as two and a half, three feet tall, and then a cluster of flowers at the end of the stem. Uh, this is uh, Glabrescens, uh, and, and I think that this is actually the subspecies called Talsensis, named after your, your city. Um, it's it's a, a, another plant of the pinion juniper uh, uh, region. Another, next slide, please. Uh, this is James E.I., a very common plant around Los Alamos and Santa Fe. I'm not sure about up here. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Cardinalis. Uh, this is a form called Regalis. Uh, the one called Cardinalis Cardinalis blooms a wee bit later than this one. It's, it's very similar, but it has thicker leaves. Um, it's a more substantial plant. This one, though, is long-lived, and it blooms with hundreds of flowers uh, on every plant every year. Next slide, please. This is uh, the Rocky Mountain Penstemon, Penstemon strictus. Uh, another uh, plant that grows wild in Los Alamos. We're thinking, though, that it probably came from the seedings after the fire that we had there. Next slide, please. This is Pseudospectabilis, uh, a plant of southwestern New Mexico. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, Grandiflora. And uh, if you found these plants in the wild, uh, Ivy says they grow around San Ysidro. I have not gone out there to look for them. I haven't found any in New Mexico yet. But the color would either be this or white. Uh, next slide, please. This is a special strain of, of this uh, species that comes from uh, a place called Warack State Park in Nebraska. And so these are called Vandiflorus warax strain. There are many colors, uh, deep purple, light purple, pink, uh, white. Uh, there are light pinks and dark pinks. Here's an intermediate. There are even bicolors. Next slide, please. So I, I grew seeds from one of the very darkest flowers and from one of the light pinks. And next slide, please. Uh, these are a little group of progeny. I thought this was going to be an all-purple group because uh, these were seeds from the deep purple plant. There's a deep purple here, another one here, a lighter purple here, a dark pink, and a light pink here. And the next slide, please. These are all grandiflora? These are all grandiflora. Wow. And this little collection are from their seedlings from the pink flowered plant. And you can see there are here one, two, three, four, five uh, purples, a dark pink, and a light pink. So I, I'm fond of saying that if Gregor Mendel had started working with Penstemon, we wouldn't know who he is today. Uh, he's fortunate that he worked with sweet peas. Next, next slide, please. This is Cobia. This is the largest flower of all of the Penstemons. It, it too, Ivy says that it's found around uh, uh, San Ysidro. I think he's actually talking about the hills west of San Ysidro. It can be a deep purple color like this. This picture was just taken two days ago. So this is going on now in, in the garden. Uh, next picture, please. Uh, it, it is sometimes white, uh, sometimes a deeper purple. This year, there's actually one that has a purple tube with a white face on it. And the next picture, please. Uh, here are three shades of, of that plant again. Next picture. Um, here are two progeny from a wild plant that I wanted to get seeds from because it had white flowers with just a tinge of pink around the edge. Beautiful flower. And, and these are seedlings from it. Uh, I have two others and, and they're not like the parent plant either. So this again <laughs> is some kind of segregation of color that is complex and uh, uh, it, 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 it is not preserved in lineages uh, like in, uh, in the Albigas uh, species. Next slide, please. This is Neomexicana. This is a plant that is just gorgeous. The, the, these pictures were just taken in the last few days. Uh, it's a plant of southern and central, south central and south New Mexico. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, here's a, a larger plan of it that is just beginning bloom. And the next slide uh, is a close-up. Uh, these, these projected slides don't do it justice. Uh, some of the flowers actually have three different shades of blue on, on this tube uh, part of it. But anyway, a very beautiful plant. And I'm, I'm hoping to uh, encourage the nurseries in Santa Fe to, to carry this plant. I'm going to talk to Gail Haggard about that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Palmer Eye, which I'm sure you've seen. It's one of the more common large New Mexico penstemons. Very nice plant, as you can see here in front of a fence. Next slide. Uh, or it's also very nice for a backdrop to other penstemons. They're, they're like, they're, they're short white ones here that are different species, the tall pink and the tall orange red here. Next slide, please. Uh, these occur in almost a pure white, a light pink, and the next slide, and some with uh, a lot more pigment. Uh, very beautiful, I think, uh, some of these flowers. Again, you can see the, the obvious beard tongue. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a subspecies of Barbados called Torii. It exists in the, the Four Corners region. It's not quite as robust as our local uh, Barbados Barbados, uh, but it's very nice to have because it blooms about two to three weeks earlier than, than Barbados Barbados, the more common one uh, that we have here and, and in Los Alamos. Next picture, please. Uh, this is the, the, the uh, Barbados Barbados form of, of that plant. Very, uh, very attractive to hummingbirds. Next, next picture. Uh, this is Brandigii. Uh, this is a, a kind of coarse plant. You can see it has big leaves, and compared to other penstemons, it's a little on the coarse side. But boy, if you want a green plant in a dry area, I highly recommend this plant. It's just amazing. The next slide shows a single plant, and this, this picture was taken just a few days ago. This is a garden this year. Um, uh, many flowers. Um, a green plant all during the summer. Uh, this is uh, uh, ambiguous. ambiguous, thank you. Uh, and, and next picture, please, is a close-up of that. I'm sorry, I'm... I no, that's okay, that's fine. This is great. Uh, okay, uh, anyway, this is ambiguous. Uh, you can see that the, the two lobes on the upper lip and three lobes on the lower lip uh, are not as obvious. This looks more like a phlox flower, and, and hence the name ambiguous. Um, there, there's a, a slightly pinker version called Thurberi, which I have, but so far it hasn't done very well. It's a, I, I have two plants of it, and they're, they're both on the small side. Uh, next picture, please. Uh, this is Rostroforus. Uh, it's another plant that has, this is also from Four Corners and, and West, um, it, it's a plant that has flowers like um, uh, uh, Barbados, but uh, it grows in a different shape. It's more of a shrub. It gets woody at the base, and it also blooms later than Barbados. So, uh, for example, there are no flowers on these plants yet. They haven't started blooming this year. So, uh, it's another very nice addition to carry uh, flowers through a longer bloom season. Next slide, please. This is a, a picture of that plant in the wild, uh, growing in one of the driest areas you can imagine. This is a, a sheer rock face and, and just the slightest bit of soil on the ledge here. And here is this plant. There's a single flower that it had. It's actually from this plant that I gathered seeds for the garden. This is in uh, southwestern Utah. Next slide, please. Uh, this is Rigberbii. Uh, in, in Los Alamos, this grows up in the Bayou Grande. I, I don't know uh, where else. It likes uh, uh, kind of wettish meadows up there. I found it there on San Antonio Mountain. Uh -huh. and in, in the Bayou Grande, it blooms like in, in July and August. In the, in the Penstemon Garden, uh, this plant, this picture was taken this year. It's already bloomed. Uh, next, next slide. This is Whippolanus, uh, which can be a, a waist-high penstemon, or under dry conditions like this, it can be this gorgeous rock garden plant. Uh, 
Uh, look at the color of those flowers. And that next slide, please, is a close-up of that. <laughs> very unusual and very nice for any rock garden. Uh, that's the end of the, uh, the Penstemons from New Mexico, and I've used up my time. I, I did want, there are many beautiful Penstemons from other states, and sometime maybe we can have another talk if you're interested, and I can talk about Penstemons that are not from New Mexico. Uh, thank you very much, and be happy to welcome you. I've seen that in Ponderosa Forest and Pine areas. Well, it, it, it likes your hot sun there in the parking lot. You know, these seeds, uh, do you know where Camp May is in Los Alamos? Behind, behind Los Alamos is a ski area, and just adjacent to the ski area there's a place called Camp May that was built in the very early years of the lab as a retreat. And, and up there, it, it grows like waist high and it blooms in July and, and early August and in the seeds from those plants um, grow about a foot high and and look like this in in May and June in the in the Okay, so over a range. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And are they all that very deep? Uh, the local plants are, but but there are also white plants that aren't really white. They're they're a, a milky sort of dirty white. Uh, I don't like those, and in some places they predominate apparently. Uh, I I got some seeds once because the idea of having a white one was intriguing, and they're just not a very attractive uh, flower. But and some of them are are this kind of shade, but but lighter, but. But the colony that I got these seeds from are all dark like this. Uh, it looks like a pretty large glossy uh, Yeah, it, it is. It's uh, Yeah. So when you have your seeds that have germinated, when you put that in your soil, do you put the whole thing in soil and it just cover it up a little bit, or how do you? How do you transfer? I, 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 in the Jiffy 7 pots or, or in the 2x2 two two pots, I take a toothpick and make a little tiny hole. If, if the, the radicals are only barely emerging, the first thing you see is just a white dot. And that's a good time to get them because nearly all of them will grow. And you, you just transfer that and put it just under the surface. And then you can take um, that squirt bottle that I have. It gives a very fine stream of water and you can wash over it so that the, the soil washes just over the, the, the seed and, and they grow. Uh, they'll, they'll first send down a root and then, and then uh, grow. Yeah. Um, I was down to your garden a couple of weeks ago and noticed the texture of the pressure vine or whatever you call it that's in the bed. And I didn't realize that that was a, a dressing. And I have an area that I, a disturbed area I want to reclaim. So, how, what would be the depth of using that to cover the soil? You, you know, it varies. It wasn't done very carefully in the gardens here. It varies from almost none to three inches, I would say, at, at a maximum. And I tend to like the, the deeper stuff. I, I think uh, it does better. When I first started planting the penstemons, I didn't know what effect that would have. And so for woodland species, I would try to dig down into the soil, the clay underneath, and mix it with the top and, and plant the plants in that. But I found now that all of them can be planted in the crusher finds alone. You know, the, the two-inch pots are only about that deep. And, and I, don't, I don't dig down and try to mix the soil anymore. They do perfectly well by spreading the first roots into the crusher finds and then sinking them into the soil later. Yeah. Yeah. So two by two pots, uh, so about how, what's the temperature that you like to grow those? Good question, um, because uh, when I start, I start germinating seeds usually around Christmas time, and the first ones always grow better than the ones that are growing now. Uh, I, I grow them in what I call a plant room, which is a, a room that has all south-facing windows, and it has four large skylights. But it is not enough light to grow without, without artificial lights. I grow them under banks of artificial lights. And, and the, the two-inch pots become whatever the ambient temperature is. 
And I'd lose many fewer plants in January, February, through March than I do after that. Right now, uh, I, I have trouble keeping them alive. They don't like to be in those two-inch pots. Uh, it's too hot, do you think? I, I think, I, I, yeah, I, I, it's not really hot, but I think it's too hot for them. I, I think, you know, their roots um, are almost miraculous to have them survive the con drought conditions that they do, because they don't have really deep roots. They have these fibrous roots that go out and somehow can withstand the drought. But that kind of root cannot tolerate being jammed together you know, in a little pot. And, and so I think they're very temperature sensitive. That's just an observation, but I, I lose a lot more plants after like uh, March, April. So do pestilence, do the root systems of them, because I noticed everything I planted in my beds is now out of my beds, and go across the driveway or wherever they want to go. Um, so do they grow a real shallow root system with one tap root, or do they grow deep? Some of them grow deep. Uh, most of them have more or less shallow roots that spread out. Um, yeah. Like in the Pennsylvania garden now, I, I have plants spaced at like 10 inch intervals. And at first I thought that was too far. But as these plants get to be this big, the clumps are that big, if you dig down, it's just solid roots between them. So they just, and, and it, it's almost impossible to get new little plants. That's one thing that affects the, the, the ability of seeds to germinate if the Adult plants are thick enough; the, the, the seedlings just can't make it. Um, they just keep moving out. I mean, it's uh -huh. like, yeah, they, 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 they do move. The same thing is happening. Uh, the first year I had maybe 30 seedlings, and last year I had probably 700. And this year I expect many more than that. And are you letting them go? Uh, I'm doing several things. I, I'm planting a lot of them in the areas around the. They, I'm very interested in people worry about cross-pollination and hybridization. And, and that is a problem with penstemons, but I think it's overstated. Uh, I don't think it's as bad as it, as it is. I, I planted maybe three, four hundred seedlings in various beds, and, and just one of those has signs, uh, not signs, it's a real, it's a hybrid, no question about it. It's but just one plant, yeah, out of three hundred. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think uh, probably the hybrid, there, there have been careful studies done and they show that most of the hybrids are weak plants and in order to get them to flower you have to nurse them along, you know, in, in special beds, that sort of thing. So I, I don't think uh, hybridization is as much of a problem. As they last one generation. Uh, that That's too, it. that too, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a technique for transplant? Transplanting? You, you, you know, uh, I've had good luck with transplanting, especially if you wait until after the showers start and, and we have partially cloudy skies. I, I don't like to transplant in these bright sunny skies that we have now, but once, if you wait until late summer or fall, I, I get almost, I, I think probably 95% success. So, so, and and I, I simply dig them out. Sometimes the, the crusher finds pretty much fall away and they're almost bare rooted. If that happens, I try to spread them out like they were and, and cover them up again. But the, the, the plants can survive that. Yeah. Are you leaving the flower stalk just on? I, I, I like to, uh, I, I think it's good to leave a few seed pods on every plant. I think that the hormonal balance in a plant that's producing seeds is important. And so I like to leave a few of them on, but not so many that, that it exhausts the energy of the plant. And so I try to go through and cut some of them all the way back and, and leave a few others. Uh, they, they've gotten interested uh, in, in seeds at the Nature Center, and I have some seeds here of some of the species I showed you. I have five different kinds. Uh, I don't get a thing from these seeds. In fact, the penstones don't either. It's kind of a money-making thing for the Nature Center. They're five dollars a packet uh, if you're interested in, in the seeds. I, I have some uh, with me. Um, yeah. 
under the crusher fines, do you put just soil that doesn't have grasses, or do you put that landscape sort no. of weed barrier? No, it's just, that was all done before I, I started planting penstemons, and it was just the grounds of the nature center used to be a storage area for crushed concrete and asphalt. And so when I started planting penstemons, I would get wheelbarrow loads of crushed asphalt. And, and I thought, these plants are never going to survive in this. But they do. And anyway, it's just pure soil with crusher vines on top of it, native soil. Yeah. You, you germinate in your refrigerator. Yeah, right. But do you have a light in there? No, no. no. It's, uh, it's, it's dark. and you, You'll read in books that some germinations require light. I, I When I get the plates out to look at them, they're under a, a strong fluorescent light. But other than that, they're in the dark. And, and I've been able to germinate even these dark germinations, even the light germinations. Yeah. Any natural seed seedlings popping up in the cluster plants? Yeah, that, that's what I meant when I said that I, I two years ago I got about thirty, and last year I got like seven hundred. Um, right. So yeah, they're they're all seedlings, and and just a very low percentage of those are showing signs of being hybrids, you know, between two species. 